There we go. Yeah, no, I'm happy today to uh, welcome Jeff Erickson as our Fernand Hurtado Memorial Lecturer. Jeff uh, received his PhD degree at the University of California, Berkeley in 1996 under the supervision of Raymond Seidel. After a postdoc at Duke, Jeff has been in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign since uh, 1998, where he's now a professor. Jeff is well known for his work in computational geometry and computational topology. Within computational topology, he has interests in curves on surfaces, embedded graphs, and combinatorial surfaces. Within computational geometry, he has done work on Delaunay triangulations, polygonal chains, brain searching, mesh generation, kinetic data structures, and realistic geometric complexity. Among the awards Jeff has received are many for teaching excellence. Most of you will be familiar with his open access book on algorithms. Jeff gave his first CCC talk in 1995, and we are happy to hear from him today. Take it away, Jeff. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. All right, thank you. All right, so um, uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction and thank you to um, all the organizers for inviting me to speak um, and thank you all for showing up. Um, it's an honor to be here and it's a particular an honor to be giving the, the Ferran Hurtado Memorial Lecture. Um, Ferran is well known, I hope, to most of the audience um, as uh, a, a productive computational geometer. He made many um, technical contributions in the field, in particular at this conference and with many of the people who are here. Um, but I, I mostly remember um, Fran as um, a human being, as someone who was not only um, excited by computational geometry, but who was passionate about life and who was um, someone who exuded warmth and joy and really um, tried to make other people feel welcome. Um, and I hope that this talk does uh, you know, a small amount of justice to his memory and shows a little bit of the, the, the influence um, that he's had on the field. Um, we miss Ferran dearly. Um, I'm only sorry that he couldn't be here to see the talk in person. So I am going to talk about chasing puppies. Um, this is uh, the results of what Eric would call a super collaboration that happened while I was on sabbatical at um, Utrecht about a year ago uh, with Arena Martin, Till, Jerome, and Jordi. Um, just to uh, warn you, um, this is going to be a talk that involves some math. Um, but the math is going to be relatively gentle. I'm not going to go into a lot of technical detail. There'll be lots of pretty pictures. Um, but I may occasionally say things that are unfamiliar or uncomfortable. Please do not hesitate to interrupt me with questions. Um, just speak up. If you have a question while somebody else is already asking a question, um, go ahead and type it in the chat. And uh, I'll try to, to get to it as soon as I can. Um, if I seem to ramble on because I'm not noticing, um, Mark and Jody have uh, permission to interrupt me. Um, so please uh, do interrupt me with questions. It'll make the talk much more interesting for everybody. So here's the problem. A human and a puppy are walking on a hiking trail and they find themselves separated. The human was distracted thinking about uh, trapezoidal decompositions on toruses, and the puppy was distracted because it saw a grasshopper or a rabbit or something. And they both come out of their respected reveries and notice that they're at different locations on the trail. They're not at the same place anymore. And to keep things simple, I'm gonna model the trail as a simple closed curve in the plane. And in particular for the talk, I'm going to assume um, the, the trail is sufficiently generic. There are some degenerate situations that I, that I don't want to talk about. Now, the puppy wants to rejoin the human, but um, it's scared to leave the trail. The space around the trail is covered with tall grass and snakes and 
fireworks and rolled up newspapers and other things that it wants to avoid. So the most that it can do is move locally along the trail to minimize its distance to the human. Now the human can move around on the trail as well and guide the puppy. So in this example, the human moved to the right, the puppy also moved to the right to stay at a local minimum with respect to distance. Until the puppy reached this, the, the bottom of this curve and, and realizes that by running around the curve, he can get closer to the human. And then the human could guide the puppy to the left, and the puppy runs around. And then the human guides the puppy to the right, and the puppy runs around. And the puppy and the human are rejoined. Everybody's happy. So the question is whether it is always possible for the human to do what you just saw in this example. By moving on the trail, is it possible for the human to guide the puppy back uh, so that the two are together? Or is it possible that the human and the puppy might be um, separated forever? And again, the outside of the trail is, is you know, filled with uh, lava and taxes and coronavirus and other things that the human wants to avoid. So the human is also forbidden to leave the trail. Now this problem, um, it looks pretty simple on this toy example, but when the curves get more complicated, it's maybe not so obvious. I mean, in particular in this toy example, um, hopefully uh, you saw um, you know, another way to do it, like going human moving to the left. Um, uh, but when the curves get more complicated, it's maybe not so easy to see. Now, um, uh, I've, this problem was actually first raised at this conference about seven years ago by Michael Biro as an outgrowth of his work um, as a PhD student on beacon-based routing. Um, most of the progress on this work, uh, in fact, I, I, I should say all of the progress on this work is unpublished. And so some of the history I'm relaying here, it was it's sort of oral history that was relayed to me from um, Michael Abrahamson. Um, there is an easy quadratic time algorithm to decide whether the human can catch the puppy or indeed whether the human can always catch the puppy, um, either from a given starting configuration or from any starting configuration for a given trail. Um, if the trail is not simple, then it's definitely possible for the human and the puppy to be separated. Um, easy example is to take a curve that looks like it's going around a circle twice. Um, if the human is, say, here and the puppy is, say, there, then no matter what the human does, the puppy's always going to be on the other branch of the curve. Joe O'Rourke figured out fairly quickly that if um, you have an orthogonal polygon, then the human can always catch the puppy just by heading in any particular direction and just walk around the, the trail, just always working forward. And in particular, by the time the human has walked at most twice completely around the trail, the puppy will be at its side. Um, but this same strategy does not work for all simple um, trails, even simple polygonal trails. And this is an observation that um, I believe was independent by Michael Abrahamson and David Epstein. Um, and their argument is pretty straightforward. If the trail looks like an infinite zigzag, and the precise details don't matter as long as these angles are at most, are, are strictly less than 90 degrees. If the human starts at one corner of the zigzag and the puppy starts, say, one zigzag behind, then when the human moves forward, the puppy follows along until it gets to that bottom corner and then it rushes up to get closer to the human, but doesn't quite make it over the hump. Because if the puppy moves any further up the hill, um, it'll actually be getting further away from the human. Then the human moves forward and the puppy actually moves backwards. The human moves up the side of the next hill. Um, and now we're starting to repeat the pattern. Um, as long as the human continues moving to the right, the puppy will also move more or less to the right, but always one step behind. And you can replicate this behavior uh, on a closed curve just by making a sufficiently small, uh, sufficiently dense zigzag um, around to, uh, the, the teeth of a gear. So as long as the human moves to the clockwise around this curve, the puppy will also move mostly clockwise and always one step behind. Um, another example that maybe shows that this problem isn't completely trivial is a related result that was posted to the archive about six weeks ago by um, 
a team of a, a, one of Eric's super collaborations. I, I'm going to reformulate the problem a little bit. So instead of trying to catch a puppy, uh, the human wants to catch a guppy that's swimming in the lake. Um, the human can walk anywhere on dry land but can't swim. The guppy can swim anywhere it wants in the lake but can't go on dry land. And the guppy swims as fast as possible. Um, and their main result is on the, for the lake that you see on the screen, um, the human can't actually catch the guppy. No matter how the human moves on dry land, the guppy will always get stuck somewhere else. So the main point of this talk is that in fact, on any simple trail, no matter where the human and the puppy start, the human can catch the puppy. Okay, so that's the main result. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll uh, describe sort of the main tool for this result, which should come as no surprise to anyone who has seen me give a talk in the last 10 years, um, is going to be a torus. Specifically, I'm going to be thinking about the configuration space of two points on the trail. So we can think of the, you know, give the trail an arbitrary base point, this point down here that's indicated by an arrow, and an arbitrary orientation. And then I can specify any location on the trail by a number between zero and one. So if I want to specify two locations, one for the human and one for the puppy, I write down two numbers between zero and one, and that can be interpreted as a point in the unit square. So the horizontal coordinate uh, represents the position of the human and the Y coordinate represents the position of the puppy because puppy ends in Y. Um, so normally you would think about this uh, as, you know, a donut, uh, but this is the, you know, the standard recipe for mathematically constructing a torus is I take a square and identify the, the, the left and right sides and I identify the top and bottom sides. Um, and this is just an indication that if the puppy moves over the base point, it doesn't really notice. It's the same as if the puppy falls off, if the horizontal line falls off the bottom of the square, it just reappears on the top of the square. Think of the space uh, emulated by the, the video game Asteroids or Pac-Man. Now, within that configuration space, I'm going to classify the configurations according to the way the puppy behaves. So um, I'm going to distinguish specifically between forward configurations and backward configurations. So a forward configuration, like the one you see on the screen now, um, the puppy wants to run forward along the curve consistently with the arbitrary orientation that I give the curve because that will decrease the distance to the human. Um, a backward configuration, on the other hand, the puppy wants to run backward along the curve because that will decrease the distance to the human. Um, for a sufficiently smooth, well-behaved curve, it's enough to look at the the partial derivative of the distance with respect to the puppy, right? So these are colored sort of vaguely, um, vaguely blue and vaguely brown on the screen. Um, and the, the, the actual um, object that we're going to use to reason about these uh, the strategies for moving the puppy around is something we call the puppy diagram. This is the boundary between the forward and backward configurations in the configuration space. Uh, so this arrangement of curves that you see here on the screen. Now, just because um, the puppy diagram is the boundary of a reasonably well-behaved subset of the torus, it's necessarily going to consist of a set of simple disjoint closed curves on the torus. Um, it's not necessarily clear in the picture here, but this particular puppy diagram consists of four closed curves. One of them is the main diagonal. Um, uh, that's the, the, the circle that represents the puppy and the human being in the same place. Then I have a couple of closed curves, one here and one here. And all of the other segments that you see actually glue together by wrapping around either horizontally or vertically around the torus. 
Um, now, the, the coloring of these curves represents yet another classification of, again, how the puppy would behave if the configuration were located on that curve. So there are critical curves where the derivative of distance is zero, and those are either local minima or local maxima, for the most part. If um, the puppy's at a local maximum for distance, we'll call this a repulsive critical curve, and these will be indicated in red, slightly thinner lines um, in the puppy diagram. Um, an attractive critical point, a critical configuration is one that's a local minimum with respect to distance. Um, this is where the puppy doesn't want to move in either direction. And then you'll have these special points called pivots, which are inflection points for distance. Infinitesimally, the puppy doesn't have any advantage moving in either direction. But um, moving a finite distance, uh, either one way or the other, will, will decrease the distance. And the way the puppy diagram will be organized is these critical curves will either be complete circles, like the main diagonal, or they'll be monotone paths um, that meet in pairs, always one attractive and one repulsive, at these um, uh, pivot configurations. And another way of saying this is a pivot configuration is a, um, it's a critical configuration that um, is sort of a, an X extreme or uh, either on the left or the right. Okay. Now the way that the puppy moves around the rules mean that we can describe the evolution of the system um, as a path through the, through the puppy diagram that starts by always moving directly either up or down to the nearest attractive critical curve. And then the human moves, the configuration moves along that, that critical curve, either to the left or to the right until it reaches um, a pivot point. And then it follows the vertical segment from the pivot point and continues. So the, the strategy is a path that always alternates between segments of attractive critical curves and vertical segments coming out of pivot configurations. So this is the basic structure that we're going to be reasoning about. Now, when we started working on this, we came up with all sorts of guesses, all sorts of hypotheses for how these puppy diagrams behaved, what their geometric structure was. Um, we thought, oh, maybe the, the, the curves are never nested, or maybe they can't zigzag and interlock too much. And we discovered that um, all of these hypotheses we were able to shoot down by coming up with more complicated examples. Um, but these examples became, you know, increasingly burdensome to come up with by hand, so we did what any self-respecting mathematicians would do. We wrote some code. Um, I have to admit to being unreasonably proud of this particular um, piece of code because it's the first significant piece of code I've written in about 20 years. Um, but here it is. Uh, so this is the puppy diagram on the right of the polygon on the left. And you see the same basic structure as the cartoon example that I gave in the earlier slides. There's a bunch of zigzags in here because these are aliasing artifacts from the, the fact that the trail is actually a polygon instead of a smooth curve. Um, if you refine the polygon, the aliasing artifacts get smaller, but at least point-wise, um, this converges to nice smooth curves, although the derivatives are kind of messed up, but those are not going to play any role in the argument. Um, so, you know, you get nice, pretty pictures from um, drawing these things. More complicated trails um, necessarily give you more complicated puppy diagrams. Um, in particular, we could see um, why we would get this behavior from um, Mikkel and David's example of a monotone strategy not always working. So if I zoom in here near the main diagonal, you see these little islands. Um, the, the, the islands correspond to, well, let me see, if I start with say, the human here and the puppy here, and the human's moving clockwise, um, what you'll see once the human moves is the configuration moves along that green path to the, to the left end, and then falls down to the next green path, and then it moves to the left until it gets to the end, and then falls down to the next green path. And each time it falls, the, the path hits the next island, 
and moves further to the left, and it never can reach the main diagonal. Um, the big islands uh, that you see, those correspond, I believe, to the angles on the outside of the teeth, and the little islands correspond to the angles on the inside of the teeth and the gear. Um, more complicated examples, this was an example that, that, that showed us that uh, you can have nested critical curves, uh, these long, skinny, oval-like things um, you know, in this part of the curve uh, are, are nested. Um, this is an example that I'll, I'll talk, come back to near the end of the talk uh, that tells us about the quadratic lower bounds. Um, and just, you know, we get lots of nice, simple examples. And using the, the, these kinds of things, we are able to develop a bit more intuition than just drawing things on the whiteboard by hand. But the pictures, especially this example, I, and the pictures look awfully messy. And it doesn't really seem to be any good um, geometric structure. I mean, they're pretty, we like them. I'm inordinately proud of them, um, but uh, the pictures aren't gonna provide us a proof. We, we really need to do some reasoning. And it turns out that the reasoning is not going to be, is gonna be almost entirely not geometric. It's going to be topological. Um, in particular, I, I need to do some little bit of elementary topology on the torus. Um, the only thing you need to know is that there are two kinds of closed curves on the torus. There are contractible curves, which contractible means you can morph the curve down to a single point. And there are essential curves. Um, essential curves wrap around the torus, either wrapping around horizontally, wrapping around vertically, or in the case of this blue curve, actually wrapping around both. Another way of thinking of contractible is that if you cut along the curve, you separate the surface into two pieces, one of which is a disc. Whereas if you cut the, the, the surface around an essential curve, it doesn't actually split the surface into two pieces. So um, it's not too hard to see that um, because the puppy diagram is the boundary between uh, say positive and negative values of some function over the torus, that uh, that boundary must contain an even number of essential curves. So the puppy diagram must contain an even number of essential critical curves. Um, the argument is essentially, as I wander around the torus along any closed curve, um, I'm going to change between forward and backward configurations an even number of times because I always end up in the same kind of configuration that I started in. But in all of the examples that we came up with, the puppy diagram had exactly two essential critical curves. So in the example you see here on the screen, there are exactly two. There's the main diagonal, as there always is, but then there's this other curve, which um, winds back and forth, wrapping around um, eventually from the bottom back here to the top. And, um, you know, this is a pattern that repeated even for the most complicated inputs. Uh, it takes a little bit of, you know, um, you know, careful attention to pick out that, that other essential critical curve. But there's always only one. And the rest of the puppy diagram organizes into a bunch of, of uh, contractible critical curves. And so we, we saw this pattern and we thought this, this looks like something we might be able to use. And in fact, we use this as the basis for a proof. We split the argument into two parts. First, we wanted to know that this pattern that we were seeing always replicated, that it was real, that no matter what simple closed curve you start with, you're always going to get a puppy diagram that has only two critical curves, essential critical curves. And then the second step is, well, if we've got a good puppy diagram, one that has two essential critical curves, that is sufficient to guarantee that the human can catch the puppy from any starting configuration. Okay, so this is the strategy that we're going to follow. We didn't really have much of a clue about how to do lemma one, so we started with lemma two first. Let's assume that the puppy diagrams always look the way we think they always look, and then see what we can prove. Now, in order to prove lemma two, I need to make a 
different classification of configurations into what I'll call sinister and dexter configurations. It's just two, you know, oppositely sounding words that are different from forward and backward. Um, and this is not going to be a classification, but just a labeling. A configuration might end up getting both labels, and in principle, it might end up getting neither. Um, and so remember um, from the previous slide that the strategy for catching the puppy is a path through this puppy diagram that falls up or down to a, an attractive critical curve and then follows that critical curve to a pivot point and then repeats until you get to the main diagonal. A Dexter configuration is the beginning of a strategy that ends with a downward pivot, like the two strategies you're seeing here on the screen. In other words, at the end of the strategy, the puppy will be running backwards along the curve, or if you want another mnemonic, it's moving on to the main diagonal, moving from left to right, hence Dexter. So these two configurations are Dexter. Similarly, a sinister configuration is the beginning of a strategy that ends with a pivot that moves upward or skyward or that moves with the ends with the puppy running forward along the curve or ends with the the configuration approaching the main diagonal from right to left so um, these two configurations are sinister and you'll notice that this configuration up here at the top is actually both sinister and dexter. There are multiple strategies that, that can be used to catch the puppy from that starting configuration. Some of them are sinister strategies, some of them are dexter strategies, so this configuration is both. And in principle, if we can't catch the puppy, that means that starting configuration is neither dexter nor sinister. There's no strategy that catches the puppy at all. And so the, the claim is that any, any good puppy diagram that has only two critical, um, uh, essential critical curves, every configuration has one of these two types or possibly both. So in this toy example, here is the set of all Dexter configurations. Here is the set of all sinister configurations. And together, they covered the entire torus. So let's look at the set of all Dexter configurations. I'm going to do something that should be familiar to all computational geometers. I'm going to build a trapezoidal decomposition. Um, at every pivot, I'm going to cast um, uh, rays up and down to the next critical, uh, the next critical curve above or below. Um, and these vertical pivot segments together with the other critical curves split the configuration space into a bunch of, they're not geometrically trapezoids, but combinatorially you can treat them as trapezoids. Um, the set of Dexter configurations must be connected because um, all Dexter strategies eventually lead to the main diagonal. And it's not too hard to see that if you start anywhere inside a trapezoid and there's a Dexter configuration, then anywhere else in the same trapezoid, there's another Dexter strategy. So if I can fall down and go this way, then from any other thing in the same strategy, I can essentially follow the same strategy to get out. So every trapezoid is either entirely Dexter or entirely not Dexter. Um, so a little bit of case analysis uh, shows that in the neighborhood of any pivot configuration, so any pivot con configuration is going to be incident to four trapezoids. In this example, one to the left and three to the right of that vertical segment, but it, it might be swapped left, right, it might be swapped up, down. And among those four trapezoids, either none of them are dexter, all of them are dexter, or exactly two of them are dexter. So in particular, if I assume here that trapezoid one is Dexter, that implies that trapezoid two is Dexter because I can always move from trapezoid two into trapezoid one. And it also implies that trapezoid three is Dexter because I can move from trapezoid three into two. And similarly, I can move from four into two. Okay. So these are the only local configurations you can see at the pivot points. 
And between the fact that that's connected and this sort of local monotonicity property, um, it follows that this, the, the set of all Dexter configurations is a monotone essential annulus, meaning it's the space between two essential closed curves, one of which is the main diagonal. Monotone here means that if I look at any vertical line, the intersection of that vertical line with the set of Dexter configurations is a single non-empty vertical segment. Uh, segment might wrap around the, between the top and bottom of the square, but remember the top and the bottom of the square are only there so that I can draw a picture. They're not really there of the torus. Symmetrically, um, oh, sorry. Symmetrically, the set of uh, sinister configurations is also a monotone annulus, but um, I've got one more step. If I look at all the configurations just outside of this Dexter annulus, they're all forward. So just below, the puppy wants to go up because there's the main diagonal just above it. On, on the other hand, just above, the, the top boundary of the Dexter annulus is all made of repulsive critical curves and, and pivot segments. So again, the puppy wants to get away from those repulsive curves. So again, it wants to go up. But just inside, the puppy wants to go down. And essentially the same argument that shows that the puppy diagram as a whole needs to have an even number of central critical curves implies that this annulus must also contain an even number of central critical curves. And because it contains the main diagonal, that even number must be positive. There must be at least two essential critical curves inside this Dexter annulus. So again, symmetrically, the set of all sinister configurations is also a monotone annulus. It also contains an even number of essential critical curves, and that even number is at least two. But if I have a good puppy diagram, there are only two essential critical curves. And so both the sinister annulus and the dexter annulus must contain them both. And because those two annuli meet on different sides of the main diagonal, it follows that the two annuli actually cover the entire torus, which is what we need to prove. So this is, by the way, the first step in this argument where I use the assumption that the puppy diagram is good. Everything I said prior to that about being a monotone annulus applies to puppy diagrams of arbitrary curves in arbitrary spaces, not just simply closed curves in the plane. Okay, so this is enough to prove lemma two. If the diagram is good, meaning it has two of these essential critical curves and exactly two, then the human can always catch the puppy. You'll notice that I never actually constructed a strategy. It's a non-constructive proof and I'll come back to that again at the end of the talk. So this left us with lemma one. How do we prove that a simple trail actually has a puppy diagram with this topological structure? Um, and at this point, we sort of realized something about what we've been doing. So far, at no point in the argument have I ever said anything about the geometry of the trail. All of the arguments were about the geometry of the puppy diagram, but I never used the fact that the puppy diagram came from a simple closed curve of the plane or from a closed curve in the plane at all. Maybe this is, you know, a closed curve in some bizarre eight dimensional hyperbolic space. Um, maybe it's just some function over the torus that happens to be zero on the main diagonal. Um, so in order to, actually prove anything about simple closed curves, we, we have to start using geometry somewhere. And this is, this is where we start using geometry. So let's look at, the, look at the, the, the game that we're playing from the puppy's point of view. The puppy always tries to be at a local minimum with respect to distance. Um, one of the things that that local minimum means is you're at a critical point for this distance function with respect to the puppy's position. 
Um, geometrically, that's the same as saying that the normal, the line normal to the curve at the puppy's position passes through the human's position. At a local minimum, if the human were to the left of that normal line, the puppy would want to run to the left. If the human were to the right of that puppy, that, that normal line, the puppy would want to run to the right. Um, but this characterization also applies to um, uh, local maxima as well. Only in this case, if the human to the right, the puppy would want to run to the left. So in every critical configuration, the line joining the human and the puppy is normal to the curve at the puppy's position. So as far as the puppy is concerned, when the puppy is running around magically, the human always stays on this normal line. So the puppy can think, I know, I'll build a map. I'll, I'll move around the curve and I'll sort of trace out where the human can be along my normal line. And well, the puppy's not so good at thinking about angles. And so the puppy draws its map just by sweeping the line horizontally in the image that you see on the right, even though in fact, geometrically, the line is kind of rotating around. Um, and so you sweep this line around following the puppy um, and just recording a transcript of the intersection over here on the right. And you get this arrangement of closed curves, now not on the torus, but on the infinite cylinder. And since the other one we called the puppy diagram, it's sort of how the human reasons about how the puppy's going to move. This one's the human diagram. This is how the puppy reasons about how the human's going to move. Now there's a formal description here. Um, it's, uh, there's this function L that, that uh, measures the sort of sign distance between the human and the puppy when the, the, they're in critical configuration. Um, uh, you can think of this as a map from the torus into the cylinder. Um, and what you're looking at are the images of the critical curves in the puppy diagram under this map. Um, now we need to use the fact that the trail is actually a simple closed curve and here's where we do it. Um, if the trail is simple, the curves in the puppy diagram are always going to be simple and disjoint. So if I ever had a sort of self intersection between curves in the puppy diagram, that's because that normal line, can, that can only happen if the normal line sweeps over a self intersection point of the trail. So the trail is simple, there are no self intersections, right? And as I said, there's this, this function that maps the torus to the cylinder. It's really not a nice function globally. It's not like a homeomorphism or something. You can't do that. The, there's no nice, really nice function, but, you know, correspondence between the torus and the cylinder. They're different spaces. But if you restrict yourself to the critical curves, it turns out it is a nice function. So every critical curve in the puppy diagram gets mapped to a critical curve in the human diagram. And moreover, the topological status of those curves is preserved by this map. So if I have a curve that's contractible in the puppy diagram, that means it's the boundary of a disk. And so the map that takes us over to the cylinder maps that disk over as well, which means the curve over in the human diagram is also contractible. On the other hand, if I have an essential curve in the puppy diagram, it wraps around the torus once in the puppy direction. And so that means its image over here in the cylinder also wraps around the cylinder once in the puppy direction. So it's still an essential curve on the, on the cylinder. Again, it's not a nice map globally. So in particular, you'll notice that, that this, um, the two uh, contractible curves in the puppy diagram are separated by the main diagonal, but their images in the human diagram are both on the same side of the x-axis, which is the image of the, x, uh, of the main diagonal. Now, the nice thing about this is that instead of now arguing about how many essential closed critical curves there are in the puppy diagram, it now suffices to argue about how many um, cr essential curves there are in the human diagram. 
And the nice thing about um, a central curves on the infinite cylinder is they can be ordered. There's a topmost critical curve and then a second top one and then eventually a bottom one. They're not necessarily geometrically ordered, but they're topologically ordered. Um, topologically, the picture is exactly the same as a sequence of rubber bands around a toilet paper tube, even though geometrically things can be very weird. Um, because the human diagram contains an even number of disjoint essential curves, so does the human, the, the human diagram. Okay. And the last piece of the puzzle that we need is that if we look at an essential curve in the, the puppy diagram, it passes, it doesn't just wrap around once in the puppy direction, it also wrap, wraps around once in the human direction, which means it passes through every possible human position given one of these essential critical curves for your favorite position for the human, there is a configuration on that curve that puts the human in that position. So I invite you to pick your favorite essential critical curve, your favorite essential curve in the human diagram. Let's say you pick the second one. Because that curve wraps around once in the human direction, I can pick my favorite position for the human and find a, a configuration on your favorite curve with the human in my favorite position. And so I'm gonna pick the human to be at the highest point of the curve, breaking ties, say, by going to the right if there's a tie. Um, the important thing is that the human is actually on the convex hull of the trail. And you can probably, may already be able to smell where this is going. Um, if the human is on the convex hull of the curve, then it's also on the convex hull of the intersection of the curve and the normal line through the puppy, which means that point that the human is on is either the first intersection or the last intersection of the curve and the normal line, which means that that configuration we found can't be where it is on the picture. It actually has to be on the highest curve, and in fact, it has to be the highest intersection on the highest curve. So what just happened? You picked your, or possibly the lowest, you picked your favorite essential curve. And then I argued that the curve that you picked is either the highest essential curve or the lowest essential curve in the human diagram, which implies that in fact, the highest and lowest curves are the only ones that exist. There are only two. And that's the end of lemma one. And then putting these two lemmas together, that's the end of the proof. Given a simple trail, it has a puppy diagram that has only two essential critical curves. Given a puppy diagram with two essential critical curves, there's a way of proving that the human can always catch the puppy, either by a Dexter strategy or by a sinister strategy, or possibly both. Now, this is a non-constructive proof. I don't actually produce uh, a, an actual strategy out of this, but it's, it's not hard to sort of make it kind of indirectly constructive. So I can build the puppy diagram um, given a curve in any a trail in any reasonable representation. I can build the puppy diagram in n squared time and we can build this trapezoidal decomposition in n squared time and we can classify the trapezoids as being either dexterous, sinister, both in um, n squared time, and then essentially you can set it up as kind of a, a graph search um, where you search through the dual graph of the decomposition for a path to the main diagonal. Um, everything running in n squared time. And if you actually want an explicit description of the strategy, that n squared is not, you, you can't do any better than that. So. In this example that you have on the screen, if the human starts moving along these, um, the teeth of these comb, this comb down at the bottom, there are about, I don't know, N over eight uh, teeth in that comb. Um, every time the human moves back and forth, the puppy also has to move back and forth across the saw blade on the top part of the, the trail. And so the overall complexity of how the puppy moves is quadratic. And the part of the puppy diagram you should be paying attention to are these nice little Mayan stepped pyramids that show up here. Um, those little jaggedy steps, these correspond to the puppy kind of 
uh, getting stuck on a local minimum and then falling down the zigzag, much like um, Mikkel and David's example that I showed you earlier. So each of these pyramids has linear complexity and there are a linear number of them. And so starting in the middle, walking along any path to the main diagonal is going to need a quadratic number of steps. But the complexity is all sort of bound up in how the puppy moves. It's sort of natural to ask if it's possible to encode a strategy by just saying how the human moves. First, I'm going to move here, then I'm going to move there, then I'm going to move there, then I'm going to move there, and so on. And maybe you can describe the strategy by only giving a linear number of instructions to the human. Say, so move to this vertex, and then this vertex, and then that vertex. And letting the puppy's motions be just described by the rules of the game. But I think a stronger configuration is in fact, Joe Rourke's strategy that works on orthogonal polygons almost works on any simple closed trail. The only thing that we don't know is which direction to go. So Mikkel and David's example shows that you can't just walk forward and expect that to work. But our conjecture, or at least my conjecture, not all my co-authors agree with me, is that you can always either just start walking forward or you can start walking backward. Um, and more strongly, if you walk forward and you don't catch the puppy in, in most two uh, traversals of the, of the trail, you can just turn around and walk backwards and then at most two more traversals you'll catch the puppy. So the conjecture is that there's a completely oblivious constant complexity strategy that doesn't care about the shape of the curve, doesn't care about the location of the puppy, but just works. Um, there are a bunch of other natural or uh, varying degrees of natural open questions that we can ask. Um, when we were chasing this down, we wondered whether the simplicity was really the weakest condition we needed in order to get a good puppy diagram. So a weaker condition that we thought about but haven't really gotten anywhere is to look at the rotation number of the curve. This is the, the otherwise known as the tangent winding number. As you walk around the curve, um, how many times does your nose um, rotate around the compass? Um, and we can show that, that there are bad curves, curves where the human cannot always catch the puppy with every other rotation number of the sides plus or minus one, but um, a non-simple curve with rotation number one. Well, you know, here's an example that looks like this. Um, this curve is actually good. Uh, the, the human can actually catch the puppy on this curve. And so maybe every trail with rotation number plus or minus one is good. Um, another one that we thought about was um, not every three-dimensional simple closed curve is good, but all of the examples we have are uh, kind of um, non, you know, that they're bad in the sense there's no way to project them into the plane without creating a self-intersection in the shadow. So maybe if you have a path in three space, a curve in three space that has a simple projection into the plane, maybe that's sufficient for the puppy diagram to be good or maybe more weakly just for the human to always be able to catch the puppy. Um, can we generalize this from single cycles to arbitrarily or arbitrary plane graphs? So just given a human and a puppy on any plane graph, is it always possible under the same rules? for the human to catch the puppy. This requires a little bit of disambiguation of what happens when the puppy reaches a vertex and has multiple options for how to move to the human. So you can imagine the puppy's always lucky or the puppy's always unlucky or the puppy chooses at random or the puppy always chooses the one to the left. Um, lots of different versions of this you can think about. There are other questions about quadratic behavior. Um, uh, the, the puppy diagram has quadratic complexity, so if I want to build the whole thing, I need quadratic time. But maybe you can decide whether a given trail is a good puppy diagram in some quadratic time, or maybe you can classify everything on the torus as either dexterous, sinister, or both in subquadratic time, because as far as we know, the complexity of that dexter annulus is only linear. Um, and you can imagine other variants of the problem where the puppy wants to run away from the human. And then we know the circumstances where you can still catch the puppy. Namely, there's a sharp point with a less than 90 degree angle. Um, that's an exact characterization. 
but um, maybe you don't like the puppy either, and so you want to get as far away from the puppy as possible. Or maybe the puppy likes you, but you don't like it. So um, if the puppy's rabid or if the puppy's carrying the coronavirus, the puppy's chasing you around, but you want to stay away from it and you want to navigate around the curve. So maybe there's a sequence of landmarks on the curve. And the question is, can you always navigate to those landmarks in sequence um, without the puppy touching you? And again, you can think of all of these things as either characterizing what curves you can always be successful on or fast algorithms that allow you to decide, given a trail and a starting configuration, um, whether, uh, whether you can uh, achieve the goal that you want. Um, lots of other questions come up, but at this point, I think I've sprayed the fire hose at you enough. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, Jeff, uh, if you look at the uh, chat there, there's a couple up there that just came up. Okay, great. Um, so let's see. Um, so David says uh, somewhere between simple closed curves and curves of rotation number one or self overlapping curves. Yeah, we, we did also think about this. Um, we looked at, um, in particular, the, the papers that um, David and Elena Mumford and then later papers by um, Carola Bank and uh, her colleagues have written on self-overlapping curves. Um, it's a reasonable intermediate conjecture, uh, reasonable intermediate topic of study, but just the fact that the self-overlapping curves self-intersect means that our argument for lemma one is not going to go through. We really are relying on the fact that those essential curves in the human diagram are disjoint. And as soon as you have any self-intersection in the curve, that goes out the window. So we, we, we just don't know how to proceed um, in those cases. Um, 2D regions. Um, so Eric, maybe you can say a little bit more. Uh, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll come back to Joe's question in a, in a second. But, but Eric, you said um, 2D regions. Can you say a little bit more about what you have in mind? Uh, yeah, instead of a curve, like um, the the puppy, both both players are in a polygon that is not not a simple polygon, but like a say a polygon um, homeomorphic to a uh, an annulus is sort of the analog of a thicker version of a simple curve. So we we didn't think about that. I mean, my my intuition is that you can probably massage the um the proof that we do have to deal with polygons with one hole mm -hmm. but when you have polygons with two holes really the abstraction is more like the mm -hmm. more complicated planar graphs but that that's that's just intuition we 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 didn't think about it at all i mean again it's a it's an interesting question um i suspect the freedom to move around uh actually makes catching the puppy easier not harder yeah, but your but it, paper maybe maybe violates that intuition, so I'm not really sure. Yeah, I was I was hoping for some a more surprising contrast to our paper. Yeah, if you can get yeah, almost the same shape but slightly different rules about where the players can go, then and getting a different result would be cool. Yeah, I agree. Um, and then Joe asks about um, wandering around on a two manifold. Um, again, this is, this is not something that we thought about. Um, we already had a Taurus and so I was happy. <laughs> uh, so, uh, um, I, you, I, I think you'd have to be a little bit careful. I mean, we're, we're kind of using facts about, about distances and normals and, um, radius of curvature. Um, to make that normal line argument. So maybe if you're on a flat torus, you can make some similar arguments about the structure of the human diagram. Um, uh, yeah, I'd say I'm leaning more likely toward to expecting a positive outcome than a negative one. But, but again, this is not something that we thought about at all. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> um, Andrew asks if, um, in cases where the human can get the puppy, um, is there an upper bound on the total distance the human has to travel? No, we weren't able to prove that. So we conjectured that the human never has to move more than twice the length of the curve. So 
either by moving zigzagging back and forth or by just by walking monotonically in one direction or the other. But that was something we were not able to prove. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Thank you. If you scroll back, there's uh, one from Chang there that you missed. Oh, I'm sorry. If you scroll so, back in the, ch in the uh, chat. Right. Um, if we consider meeting at an intersection point of self-crossing curve of success, can a human always meet the puppy at an arbitrary generic plane curve? Um, so, uh, again, I, I, I think so. But um, we sort of took as our, our definition of success, not only does the human meet the puppy, but then the human can continue walking arbitrarily and the puppy stays with them. Um, and so there's no jumping between different branches of a self-intersecting curve. Um, I think if you really wanted to answer the self-intersecting curve case, you, maybe this is an, an intermediate step towards thinking about arbitrary plane graphs. Um, uh, but it is really requires a, a, a much more careful statement of what the precise rules are. Um, you know, when things are simple, there's only, there's, there aren't multiple ways to interpret what it means for a human and a puppy to meet. Um, when I said that non-simple curves don't work, I meant that the human and the puppy can't agree on a parameter on the curve, not that they can't agree on their location. Um, but again, this is, this is a, a, a good and, and very natural question. Um, and let's see, Mike uh, observes, it doesn't matter if the hiker is blind, they can just assume there are puppies everywhere and collect them all. Um, I don't foresee any snags, but um, uh, it's not clear to me how complex the movement of the human would have to be in order to collect everybody. So you're, you're correct that if the human can arrange somehow to visit, you know, you know, evolve the vertical line containing the human's configuration. As it moves around, that's going to collapse to a finite number of points. And then as you move, this finite number of points are going to move. Um, you can come up with some strategy that in a finite number of steps, all the points converge on the main diagonal. Um, but I don't foresee any snags there, but I think the more interesting question is how much the human has to move to actually collect all the puppies. Yes, there are puppy moms. So that would sort of be the, um, the portions along the, what did you call the lines, the green lines? Um, the um, attractive critical curves. We, we always just called them green curves. Yeah, it would be the sum of those portions, right? In one of those little arrowy things that ends on the main diagonal. I mean, multiplied by right. the length of the curve, yes. Um, well, possibly. I mean, the, 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 the counterintuitive thing is so, that... So we're that, saying that should be less than two. Oh, sorry. Um, that's, I think that's a reasonable guess. That should be less mm -hmm. than two, where the length mm -hmm. of the curve is one. Um, yeah. But there's some counterintuitive behavior that, that um, this monotone example that Michael and David came up with, where you're moving around and the puppy is just never quite getting to the main diagonal. Um, there's an opportunity there for collecting too much length if you're not careful. Um, any other questions? One more question. Well, if not, thank you very much, Jeff, for a great right. talk. Thank you for your time. Yeah, and we'll uh, reconvene here in, in about 12 minutes. See you then. Thank you.